Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, it's great to be back here, especially sort of on the other side, um, not being a student here anymore. Um, I want to start this talk with a chronology of my early work and then move into three categories that I work within as a landscape painter. I started out as a sculptor, and I think what made me a painter was what Philip Guston said. He said, when you're playing your last card and you're ready to give up, another kind of awareness enters. You truly have to have given up, and then something happens. And what happened was that painting got to me. I went to Goldsmiths College, which is, um, as an undergraduate, as it's part of um, the University of London, and its recent claim to fame is Damien Hirst and Julian Opie, among others. Anyway, when I was there, I was told that if you have something to say, here's a room, just get on with it. And two ideas come out of that education system. One is you have to trust your intuitions. There were a few required courses. And the second is that painting is a way of life. You have to be motivated to work at it every day. And um, I mean, most of the time I would meet my professors down the pub and we'd talk about painting. But um, it's very different from how I teach now, I have to say. Um, I worked at the time from still lives and um, moving into a kind of lyrical abstraction. So after Goldsmiths, I went to Rhonda. Um, and I went with Elma Thubrin, who was the, is a painter, and she's the wife of Harry Thubrin, who was my teacher, one of my teachers at Goldsmiths. Um, Harry was an extraordinary teacher, and in the 60s, before he came to Goldsmiths, he um, overhauled the English school, art school education system. He was also known as um, a collage artist, and quite extraordinary in that sense. Um, in Rhonda, um, it's, the, it's where Rilke had lived, and Hemingway, and a painter called, an English painter called David Bomberg. Um, so it's sort of steeped in a particular um, aesthetic history. Um, what engaged me then, and I made this painting when I was there, what engaged me then, and still does now, is Bumbuck's idea of the spirit of the mass, that he talks about building volume through directional planar forces, as though there's a kind of swelling volume behind each of the forms and the spaces, and together they make big, massive volumes moving in space. Um, before I left England, I and came back to the States. I made work that dealt with the physicality of the material. I was cutting up all my clothes. I was sort of shedding my skin. And I made these mixed media paintings that were sort of, they came out of the landscape, the structure of the landscape that I had seen and painted in Rhonda. And they also came out of, um, I was interested in Jungian archetypes. So I had all this hierarchy of symbolic structures of male to female female, um, oh, good and evil, um, bony versus sensual. I had this whole list of categories because I was trying to look at a way to investigate form with meaning. Um, then I came to the studio school. Um, and what this school gave me um, was a set of ideas that actually still inform my work. Um, I've always loved cubism since I was 16. And so when I came here and I encountered teachers such as Nick Caroni and Fred Thurs, um, Bruce Gagné and Charles Kajori, um, what they gave me was an understanding of uh, ideas about the picture plane, a kind of modernist cubist space, about Hoffman's legacy and fusing that with surrealism and abstract expressionism. But what they also gave me was um, a sort of critical framework to look at um, work throughout art history. And I've been looking for a way to combine uh, visual form with philosophical ideas and psychoanalytic meanings. And I found that with this group of people. And I have to say that, um, um, you know, to come here is, is 
it's a certain privilege to know these ideas that I've encountered other artists who um, just don't have this kind of foundation. And so it's extraordinary what you're, what you're given here. Um, I think that some other schools of thought um, relegate the studio school to a kind of formalist academicism. And I think that's a real misunderstanding of what goes on here. Because to me, form and content are always inextricably connected. And so, um, you know, when you inherit this legacy of the tradition, I think you have to, anybody has to struggle to find their way sort of outside of that and within that at the same time. You have to be able to shed mannerisms. And um, so I did this painting from a, a still life. I remember Mercedes Matter liked this painting quite a bit. Um, but I look at a painting like this, a drawing. Um, well, it's done in, with black and white acrylic. And this figure, you know, I'm measuring the points in space, and this figure's turning and dissolving and coming into a hole. And it just, when I look at this now, I think um, it looks like a session of intense acupuncture. So, but you know, this was my existential heyday. And um, all these figures are in a state of becoming. They're never quite solid. I would cover the canvas with with um, marks, and then out of those marks, I would pull whatever um, appeared to me. Usually, it was the figure. And um, I was painting, actually, with my hands and no gloves, so the cadmiums are soaking right in. And, and so to improve my health, or for better or worse, I went to Yale for an MFA. Um, anyway, I realized when I got there, um, I was taken to task over lots of things, that's what graduate school is about, but um, I realized that I really wasn't making decisions about in, within the work, that this state of becoming um, became very comfortable. And I was really obsessed with Kouros figures, the Greek 5th century Kouros figures, because they're in a state of stasis and, and movement. And um, one day Andrew Forge came into my studio and he told me that I was playing God, that I was so willful about um, the perfect painting and I had so many preconceptions about what a painting must be, that I never had a real dialogue with the work. And that just about did me in. Um, I wanted to be Bellini, I wanted to be sensitive and humble, all light and clarity, even though I don't work like Bellini, but I was in love with him. And, and instead, I was willful, I was dogmatic, and I was clunky as a painter. So, um, so I had to work out of this, this place in order to figure out who I was as a painter. But I want to say one thing, that um, to work in that state of in-betweenness, because I was in between figuration and abstraction, and I was in between drawing and painting, and in between a figure kind of becoming something and then dissolving into a kind of nothing, that disintegrating, um, I want to say that there's something um, very rich in that terrain that I actually still believe in, even though it was a negative when I was at Yale, um, that art's fundamentally dialectical. And I think it's about opposing, contrasting um, ideas and forces coming together in a painting to make a dynamic and unified statement. So after Yale, I went to the Midwest. I got a teaching job. And out there on the prairie, I became a landscape painter. Um, I'm from New England, and so I, I gravitated towards what was familiar, and so I looked for woodlands, and I found them, and I made a series of drawings looking for the big geometries within this absolutely chaotic woodland scene, and so I did a series of drawings and black and white paintings. Bonnet Newman said that in times of transition, you often go back to black and white, and I think that was true for me. Um, okay, this is the end of the early chronology. 
And now I'm just going to talk for the rest of the lecture about landscape painting. And I think that my work falls into three main categories as a landscape painter. Um, the first is in that I make atmospheric, I call them atmospheric paintings. They deal with broken marks that build up incrementally into um, form and space. And um, the second is um, more minimalist work where it's a kind of condensation of what I see. And the third is this Baroque tendency I have that moves into rhythmic movements of um, the color and form within the landscape. Um, all of the work that I'll show you is made in either the Midwest or um, which is Illinois and Michigan or in southern Spain. And these categories do sometimes overlap each other, but I have to say that it's hard for me to be consistent within one way of working. And I think that we have multiple selves as artists, and so I just inhabit a kind of disjunctive postmodern self. Um, southern Spain. Every year I go to Andalusia, which is in the southeastern part of Spain. It's right on the coast and the mountains and the sea. And you know, this looks incredibly picturesque. And I took this um, photograph when I was there on sabbatical last November. So it looks kind of lush, because actually I try to avoid green. I feel like Mondrian, you know, he hated green. Um, and, but it's, anyway, it was very lush. It rained more than it ever rained um, any other time, but that's when we were there. Um, and so what I paint, actually, it looks a bit more like this. Um, it's desert. It's abandoned landscape that um, during and after the Spanish Civil War, Franco, um, he relegated the Andalusians to um, just virtually a non-existence. They were his arch enemy. And um, so a lot of the inhabitants of this area fled to France. And so you see sort of derelict left um, terracing and old cortijos or farmhouses that have been abandoned. And sometimes it does. It looks like the moon, my husband says. Um, it's dry and spiky. It's very bony with sort of rocks and scrubs of grass kind of elbowing up through the earth. Um, then the light cuts like a knife. That's what Virginia Woolf said. And it, it can be piercingly painful at times in the summer. Um, so it's very harsh. It's sensual. It's like um, the flamenco music and dance that this um, comes from this part of Spain, actually. So, um, sorry, I'm going to start my atmospheric, talking about the atmospheric paintings. And, you know, I think I became a landscape painter because I wanted to be surrounded by mo my motif 360 degrees. That's something that Gretna Campbell said, and I really agree with her. Um, so in these next few paintings, you know, I'm interested, once I got out there, I was really interested in the physicality of what it means to be inside a place. And this physicality sort of deals with two things. Um, first of all, it has to do with the geological upheavals that I see, where there are these um, oh, it rises and sinks, there are cliffs, there are gullies, and the sky is moving, and there's this sense of all the these kind of visual forces at work. And then I translate that into a language of mark, directional mark making or planes that move in particular directions. And um, I think that this is sort of like what Bomberg was talking about as well, this kind of dynamic flux of visual forces. Um, and the second thing is this physicality deals with the actual um, process of landscape painting, that, that when you're out there, you have to lug your gear halfway up a mountainside or really you're down, down some road. And there are flies and, you know, none of this really, you can't see it when you look at some landscape painting, but the flies are out there, it's hot, you've got sweat, it's, it's the physical um, dimension of what it means to work inside a place like that is um, pretty powerful. I don't think it's for the meek. So I think this physicality enters into the paintings themselves. Um, I know painters who work from photos. Um, and they work from na photos of nature and they work indoors. And to me, that's just not the same thing. So um, this brings me to um, wanting to talk about the, an ecological engagement in place. 
that there's a prevalent contemporary attitude or theory that says that we're disconnected from nature and that being in nature today is a romantic fallacy or a deceit. And I think this um, idea is essentially Cartesian. It separates the body from the mind and it separates the physical from the intellectual. Um, as if nature or our environment is somehow separate from us. Um, and yet we're always in some kind of context. So it seems to me that environment influences how and what you think. Um, and you know, within this kind of um, critique or separation from nature, I think there's a real danger there and it's led to some of the current ecological disasters that we're experiencing now. It's much more easy to abuse something when you feel removed from it. So the attempt to connect with nature um, by experiencing what it means to be in the elements is really critical. Um, I try to walk the landscape, I'm not a mountain climber, but I try to walk it so that I can have a bodily and a visual memory of it. Um, ultimately, landscape painting is a form of environmental activism, I'm going to say. It's not as though it's going to, painting will save the planet. I wish it would, but it won't. Um, and I don't even think it will directly affect sometimes the way people interact with nature. But I think if a painting can allow us a space in which to contemplate our environment, um, it acknowledges that place matters. And so, embedded within painting landscape today, I think there's a kind of urgency. Um, this is a painting from Spain of several years ago. Actually, I exhibited it here, I think, at the studio school. Um, but what I want to talk about is um, the horizon. Um, I think the horizon is a real issue in terms of landscape painting. And um, I was in a show a few years back, curated by Ro Lowen. It was at the Painting Center. And um, Wolf Kahn came up to me at the opening, and he really chewed me out for putting a horizon in. That was anathema. I broke the picture plane. Um, and so I thought, God, I've spent so many years pulling everything up to the plane having this compressed space that for me it was really exciting when I painted this painting and found color, even local color, that could sit back in space and actually what it does is it locates me inside that space that in um, I think a horizon is a way of measuring space and placing myself in relation to, to the, the furthest back space so that you start to feel that, that that bigger volume. Um, the horizon, I think I found another way of dealing with it, you'll see in another body of work. Um, but where I kind of hold the plane a bit more. But anyway, um, this is where I was and this was very exciting. Now, um, Courbet. Um, Courbet is amazing and there was that great show I think last year at the Met. Um, of his, it was an extraordinary show for me. Um, but Courbet, you know, the horizon is so insistent in this painting. It sort of really declares itself in a way that for me makes the clouds in the sky kind of come down like a curtain. And then, so you have that bank of sky, again, sitting right on the edge of the um, sea with that bull-like wave coming out. And then the foreground. It's so interesting to me that he can use a language of naturalism. And yet there's such a broadness of Mark. Um, but he takes you into a kind of really elemental experience of place. And yet he he's sort of holding the plane and yet he's opening up the space. He's making a big volume. So, um, yeah. Well, I also think there's another thing about Courbet is that he's so physical with the paint and somehow, in this instance, it really connects to the physicality of the experience. Um, you know, I think in the end I had to experience a deep space in order to feel the tension between flatness and volume and that painting being flat when you have a space that opens up, it just becomes this um, really elastic relationship. And I want to say that 
space for me is not something formal. Um, it's really visceral and it's deeply psychological. Um, that I feel as though occasionally when I can make paintings where I open up the space and I'm painting a big vista, somehow it allows me room to breathe and to move, to dream, to occupy a very big airy space. Um, so, I became obsessed with clouds in this period. Um, I'm still talking about atmospheric paintings. And clouds are a weight suspended, that they have a combination of density and air that's really compelling to me. Um, I wish this were mine, but um, anyway, I've always liked Titian's entombment paintings because Christ's body seems um, really human and so heavy, and yet there's a luminosity there that you sort of pulled up. He sort of starts to, he's in between the state of being human and that moment of transcendence. Uh, the way the cloth underneath him um, kind of pushes him up, as does the figure on the left, but I love the way Mary Magdalene on the upper right yanks him into her space because they share the same kind of luminosity and color. And then the way you know, St. James on the right, kind of that beautiful arabesque as he arcs over into Christ's body and you drop down and then up Christ's arm. So there's something here to me about this up, down, in, out, but a real sense of weight sort of suspended between two moments of existence as well as pictorially. Um, in this painting of, um, I did this in Spain, it's a, a place called Cerro Judio, and that's um, a Jewish hill. It's where there was a Jewish settlement apparently years ago. It's since been abandoned. But I wanted to locate myself way down, sort of in the ground, looking up and looking at how these clouds, I was really interested in how the gesture carries a, a movement through the space. And again, it's this kind of physicality that I always want. So that it becomes airy and yet these clouds become these forces, dynamic forces moving in relation to the land. Um, this is a painting I did at Chautauqua. Um, so where the, I wanted to wait at the top of the painting with the clouds in the sky and the trees um, sort of interweaving each other and the red trees in the lower part of the painting diving into the lake. But there's always um, a sense of space and time that are related to me. I mean, a landscape painting is a collection of several moments coalesced into one moment, the when you see, or a unified hall when you see the painting. And I'm always sort of struggling with the delicacy of the particular in relation to the bigness of how a place feels. And you know, even though there's a constant sense of impermanence when painting outside, I've always liked how Adrian Stokes um, talks about paint turning to stone. So that when I paint these trees, or this tree, here in winter, it's as though that ephemeral moment becomes set in stone. And it's also painted on masonite, so it feels very rock hard. Um, so, all right. Within my painting, I, I'm constantly interested in a kind of flux, and this painting takes on three different points of view that emerged into a whole image. Um, I wanted to get a sense of, it's a 180 degree radius, and I wanted to get a sense of what that place felt like um, as a whole, and what it looked like, and then also the fact that I move inside that space. Um, this is another painting from Spain where parts of it are painted looking in one direction, then I turned around 180 degrees and painted the, some of the parts of the lower half um, of the Mediterranean right behind me. So it's always a sense of one thing sitting in two spaces or there's constant shifting flux. The next body of work is what I call my minimalist work. Um, I made a lot of these paintings. They all sort of revolve around the same, a similar subject matter, which is an irrigation pool. Um, it's called the bolsa. And um, it's about two-thirds the size of a football field. It's huge. 
I'm going to say that the paintings aren't so much about that, though there's a quality of that that seeps something about that motif that has altered my painting in a way. But the more pervasive issue is that I think of painting as a process of distillation. And I call this my minimalist paintings, but I don't mean to reference 1960s work. Um, it's not really so much about emptying out as it is about editing out. Um, it's not about reduction, it's about really finding uh, focus and sort of zooming in on that. So I'll walk you through a little bit of my process. I start by making um, studies from the motif. Um, and um, watercolor or acrylic on paper. And then I move to smaller paintings, which are studies of particular moments of light. And, um, and gradually I start to work on, uh, the paintings become a little larger, usually no bigger than about four by five feet. Um, but, you know, painting is a process itself. I mean, I think it's always about sort of an accretion and then an emptying out and editing out or, yeah, ed editing out, not emptying out. And there's a sort of back and forth. And sometimes I work in the studio. Um, I, I work mostly from the motif, but then there are times when I'll go into the studio because there's a clarity that happens in terms of memory of I distill what really is important within the painting. And so it's a back and forth sort of in the studio, then back outside. Um, this painting, for instance, uh, it's not terribly large, but um, it was there was a fence um, that sort of dissolved in terms of certain light and became this incredible um, orange fence against the blue green of the pool. And some parts of the fence seemed to want to dip into the pool. And then um, I found that the black tarp around sort of cradles this this shape of water. Um, so I was interested in how there's a kind of flux. Okay, when I painted those atmospheric, what I call atmospheric paintings, I think um, I used to believe in a kind of visual democracy. I used to think that I chose a motif because everything in my range of vision was important. And um, I don't believe that anymore. Um, I, I think that we're all selective, and so that when we look at something, we choose certain elements within our sphere of vision that um, hold us, and then we scan across that which is less important, and then we might focus again. So there's a kind of rhythm of focus, scan, focus. And what I've done within these paintings is just to kind of focus on that area that really engages me. The odd thing about these paintings is that um, in the past, some of my paintings sort of come together. I mean, all paintings do in a way. They find their own form eventually. But I actually can apprehend the whole from the start. So I see how the whole image inhabits the rectangle. Um, and that these paintings really um, moved me into, well, there's an insistent frontality that never seems to go away. And there's also a sense I moved into color. I moved into color as, as weight and as a pressure and as release. Um, there's, there's color in the light in the Mediterranean. And, um, I, you know, for instance, the foreground here, all right, I'm going to quote in a minute. Um, the foreground here, I sometimes under certain lights, I can see that this area is a gray gravel that surrounds the pool. Um, but at other times, it takes on these pinks and mauves and reddish, bluish hues. And it has to do with the Mediterranean. I mean, we all know about you know, Matisse and um, Durin. And there's something about the light, um, the moisture in the air, and how the molecules kind of refract light. Light. And so everything that you see starts to become imbued with particular hues. Um, I used to think I intensified the color, but I don't. I paint the color that I see. Um, I want to quote Herman Cherry, who wrote um, a, a 1950s American painter. Um, and he talks about color in the most extraordinary way. He said, color, colors are humanoid things to me. They take on the quality of objects. They meet, 
They separate the heavy, light, warm or cold, sympathetic or antagonistic. They have weight, lightness, and create intensity of feeling or repulsion. The space they occupy is structure the bones of paint. Light has no substance, it's a presence, and color has its own light. Um, you know, color moves in this kind of elastic manner to me. Um, it's structured and it's elemental that I, I sort of feel out the proportion of one color in relation to another color in terms of air and density, in terms of sometimes stickiness, certainly weight, um, airiness, um, and the way certain colors can throb against each other or the way that it becomes extraordinarily still or quiet. Um, this takes me into geometry. That I've always been interested in dynamic tensions within geometric pictorial structures. And so, um, but you know, the geometry is found through the proportions of color. So as I feel out um, the, the shape and the, the proportion of one color in relation to another color, um, they start to, geometry starts to move in. I used to have a horrible anxiety about the difference between drawing and color. But somehow I've managed, I don't know how it's happened, but I'm grateful it has. I've kind of moved away from that anxiety and it's as though the shapes and the geometry and the color come together. Um, it has to do with um, Bomberg's spirit of the mass again. This masses of color coming together in relation to one another. Um, and this, this kind of twisting or pulsating or um, stasis or movement. Um, and you know, the Alhambra is partly is part of this, um, part of what's happened to me. Um, the Alhambra is a Moorish um, 13th, 14th century uh, palace that's about three hours away from where I am in Spain. And um, geometry and color are really combined. So for instance, and I'll talk about this in terms of a linear structure, but it happens with color too. That when you start to work from these images and you start to draw them, um, it's boggling. You see one structure and then it opens up to another structure. And like in the lower right or even the lower left, um, if that, that sort of dark band of black, um, if you look at that shape, it could be a flat shape, like some kind of a broken hexagon. Um, and then all of a sudden it becomes a box seen in perspectival space almost. So there are these flipping, shifting elements. The way they break um, a rectangle and they um, bring in a diagonal so that every corner within a rectangle is, is, is made into an, an additional movement. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I, it's as though they keep the geometry so open so that one structure is always opening up to another and to another and to another. And um, my mind explodes when I draw these things. I can't take it. After the full structure, I'm like, oh my God, I gotta go have a drink. Um, um, and you know what's interesting to me is um, within Islam the banning of graven images provoked the question how do you talk about place without describing it and their solution is through shapes and patterns of color um, that are about rhythm and about pulse and about light and they come out of um, um, plant structures, uh, the structures within leaves, the structures within flowers, and so the the movement of water, so that there's, there's this amazing correlation in terms of place and form. All right, I have to talk a little bit about abstraction, I think. Um, that I work mainly from perception, um, but some people seem to see my work as very abstract. And I think of abstraction as going after the essence of an experience. Um, so that I use this language to go more deeply into what I see and feel, to sort of coalesce the sensations that I participate in. Um, 
in this painting, again, this is the, the balsa, and that, that looks like a diving board, but really it was originally part of a fence that went across the sort of middle foreground. And it's as though through the light, through the intensity of color falling on the left side of the pool, turning into that more acid green, the fence just dissolved. And then it seemed to kind of pull this gray structure of the fence with orange in it, pull it into the, as though it's going to lean into the water and then that shift down into the right hand side of the water where I hope it kind of pushes down. Um, so these things happen out of a perceptual experience and also a sensate experience. Um, this is going to be a bad juxtaposition, but I don't mean to talk about this literally. But you know that triangle between me and what I see and my and me and the painting itself that that opens up um, my imagination uh, when I paint. That um, I just don't have the conceptual imagination to be an abstract painter. That I. I, I like that relationship of me in relation to something much bigger than myself. And um, I, so, you know, I was, this is a railway bridge in Chicago over a canal. And I don't mean it, I wasn't even thinking about that triangular relationship so that I just described. Um, really, it's about these, um, you know, these masses of geometric shapes in relation to each other. And I love the tension where the bridge almost felt as though in one part is stable and another part it becomes destabilized. and seems seems to want to fall forward. Sort of a call response of one form in relation to another, one color in relation to another. Um, I paint a lot of water, and um, water is often cradled in a shape. Um, and sometimes it's extraordinarily still. Sometimes it feels like a sheet of glass. And it's about survival in the desert, that um, the paintings in this sense are about desire. The desire to quench thirst, to be immersed in a liquid life, light. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this later. But water reflects, and what happened to me as I was making these paintings is that somehow, maybe it was that it's so mesmerizing, um, and it slowed me way down as a painter, that um, I started to really become involved in much slower um, movements from one part of the painting to another. And um, I also worked quite a long time on these. Um, so I hope that, I mean, in some way, they're hopefully moved towards um, conveying an experience of contemplation. And when I was here at the studio school, Julian Schnabel came to give crits, um, the big crits at the end of the term. And um, he came in with his sunglasses on for part of the crits in this room. And he took them off eventually. And then he came into a studio that I was in uh, with a group of other students. And he said, you know you have to paint as though you're burning at the stake. And um, so I said to him, well, what about the contemplative? At the time, I really loved Mondrian. And um, he turned to everybody else and he said, what the fuck is she saying? And um, so I said again, well, what about the slowness of painting? And he said, well, I need to get out of here. So <laughs> he left. Um, but I think that, you know, on one level, Schnabel's saying there has to be an urgency um, when you paint. And I think that's, that's true. And I think, you know, what he was doing is trying to break certain aspects of tradition, move cubism and domesticity into a particular arena. Arena. And even connected to now, I think that um, there's a fashion for a kind of quick, casual painting. Um, and, you know, I understand the theory behind those ideas to a point, but there's just not enough going on there for me. And um, it seems to me that when I look at paintings, um, um, I mean, paintings in museums or in shows. The the more a painting sort of unfolds and reveals new elements to it that I didn't see at first glance, that I don't think you can see at first glance, um, that's the kind of painting that really interests me, where it kind of keeps um, peeling away layers, and you start to see things. They only emerge slowly through through looking, and that takes time. Um, and so I wanted to, 
say a little bit about you know, this sense of slowness and then this sense of flux. And it all comes out of cubism. And, you know, how is cubism still relevant today in our post-postmodern world? And I think postmodernism obviously comes out of cubism. But what's important is that cubism gave form to a sense of slippage. And I think that's a real... Um, Oh, it's a it's a real element within within life, a sense of shifting, changing, disjunctive relationships uh, within paintings and yeah, as I said, within within daily existence. Um, and I'm just going to talk about this very briefly. Uh, within a postmodern point of view, as far as I can understand, the fleeting moment becomes a flavor. And so that the presence of that flavor lasts for however many minutes or maybe a couple hours. And then it's replaced by a new flavor. And that this is capitalist commodity culture. Um, within this attitude, um, things, experiences, identities um, lose their meaning. Uh, they're, they become a replaceable spectacle. And so there's a kind of cynicism that comes out of this in terms of any sort of meaning, at least to me. So that, um, how can I connect this? Um, the sense of, of slippage, I'll shift to my work for a minute, then I'll come back to this idea I was talking about. You know, I was interested in this painting, which is about the balsa, and I painted it mostly from, from memory and also from studies. But like the way I wanted the bottom right to kind of drop off, and, and then hopefully come back in on the lower left with the white, that there's a sense of constant shifting and a kind of instability that's pervasive. And I think I'm a phenomenologist because I'm interested in the value of that experience. Um, and so, yeah, there are aspects of postmodern theory that are deeply problematic. And um, ultimately, there's a kind of irresponsibility. Um, cubism and ecology, for me, come together because they're about relationships that um, they're about flux within an experience and within nature. And they deal with complexities. They deal with multiple sensations. And they're arrived at through a kind of open-ended resolution solutions that need lead to the next stage. You know, I know there are lots of different postmodernisms too, and there's been some good aspects of postmodernism, um, but some are deeply problematic to me. So anyway, I'm just trying to sort of relate cubism and today, what it, how it can have meaning today, and I think it does. Um, I'll whiz through the next few images quickly. Um, this is a drawing that I made in Spain, a sort of drawing about the ferocity of, of um, this place. And this is dusk, again in Spain. You know, at dusk, the, the chalkiness of the light um, leaves, and so you're left with a more saturated, sometimes a more crisp light. Um, Next painting is of um, Oxbow in Michigan, where I taught for a summer. The School of the Art Institute of Chicago have a summer program there. And it's funny, here's the proverbial cloud again. But the thing is, this cloud turned into a kind of orange sofa that I used to sit on there at night. And <laughs> I used to talk with other artists. And so it kind of, my life seeped into the image itself. Um, this is another painting of Oxbow at dusk in Michigan. Michigan. This is um, a view out my window. There's a tree and a parking lot, actually. And the parking lot took on this amazing turquoise light. These are quite small paintings. I became obsessed with traffic cones for a while. Um, I don't want a Freudian analysis, please. Um, and But they're, they're really gaudy, and they're kind of so vulgar in terms of color. And yet, there's this amazing relationship between that color and um, the, the grayness of the, the pavement, the sidewalk around it. Um, this is a painting. Well, I was interested in, yeah, proportions of color, but it's a kind of house and a tree that actually I remembered um, was outside my window as I was growing up. But the painting took on a kind of flux and a slowness and a time of day or night, actually. Oh, there's another traffic cone. And 
And the next few paintings are about some trees that I paint in the winter outside my studio window. Um, I guess I'm getting too old to be cold because um, it gets hard to go out there when it's absolutely freezing. And I know when paint freezes. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm looking um, out the window painting my local landscape and um, in different moments of light and different moments of snow. I was also interested in, um, these are quite small paintings actually, um, painting a vertical landscape painting because it contrasts with a predominant sense of horizontality in a lot of landscape paintings. Um, so to back to horizontality. Um, can't seem to stay away. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it's about being in the Midwest where the, the horizon is so um, pervasive and it, it's such a flat la landscape where I am. Um, but, and also, as I said, the Corbet, the tradition within landscape painting of horizontality. But these paintings, um, I made several, I'm only going to show you a couple, um, of a kind of these bands of color where I was really interested in less being more. And they're arrived at through a process of eradication and distillation. Another painting. You know, I, I really want to get rid of um, distractions in the painting. And synthesis to me is when the image becomes a unified whole and the painting becomes a solid physical, visual thing in the world that asserts its ontological reality. That it's this thing and yet it also takes you on a journey. So it's a place where a kind of, um, the physical reality of it has a certain intimacy as hopefully does the image, but there's a sense of where intimacy and distance collide and hopefully reside. I have to say that this process of distillation it takes all my nerve. Um, it really is terrifying. Um, I guess I have some bad puns. I think I have too many of them. Um, anyway, this is a cliff painting, and I do, I feel as though, I didn't do this painting because I feel as though I'm jumping off a cliff, but when I make these radical decisions, they're radical to me, to get rid of certain parts of the painting, I'm really, um, um, it just, I just have to jump in. It makes me intensely vulnerable, but it's as though I get so desperate to um, arrive at some kind of clarity and yet specificity City. And I want this kind of congealed and vibrant experience. And, you know, in the end, you don't have a choice. You have to get rid of those things that get in the way. Um, this particular painting was a painting of Michigan. And it was um, really, you know, as maybe I already said this, Michigan re reminded me a lot of um, New England. There's a real density, there's a clarity to the light, and there's a real density in terms of the landscape, almost like, feels like Marsden Hartley land. And um, I had um, mountains here, I had I had boats, I had a lake, I had all kinds of stuff. And, and then I just thought, you know, the painting painting is really about the pressure of that black pushing in to this, um, what was water and hot, this, but it now looks like a red envelope with um, a kind of orange X. And so there's a kind of sense of um, pressure from within and pushing into each other, and then the sky in the distance, of course I have to have a cloud in there. And um, I mixed all the color up on the rest of my palette, and I just went in and I got rid of everything that was incidental. But you know, it feels like I'm almost having a heart attack when I do this, even though in the normal world people would not think that's a big deal. But um, it's as though everything's at stake, but you, I just, you don't have a choice, so. Um, okay. The next body of work that, this is the last part of my lecture, um, these are um, Baroque structures that I work with that somehow I can't sustain working um, within a minimalist or more, yeah, minimalist mode. Um, Louis Finkelstein, who taught here and lectured here and was an extraordinarily articulate 
Uh, he was so articulate about the complexities and the processes within painting. And um, I miss him a lot. Um, but he said that artists have two or three structures that they work with their whole life. And a few, a few extraordinary people can use four or five. Well, I'm mortal. I use two, I think. Um, and so one is a sort of wave-like structure where you drop down and you move back in space and then uh, come back over the top of the painting comes forward again. So that is a kind of scooping structure. And this painting of, an, um, of a pine grove in Spain moving out into the big vista. And the sky felt so um, heavy and buttery. And so I just had to make it like that. So this painting of the same motif, but I reversed to the complements in a lot of areas to try and get a different kind of light. OK, El Greco. Um, El Greco, this El Greco is um, at the Prado, where I try to go as often as I can when I'm in Spain. Um, and you know, El Greco's a Baroque cubist. I know that's an impossible art historical, <laughs> putting those two things together. But he doesn't have the anxiety of cubism. He doesn't come out of what cubism came out of. But he has planes that move um, dynamically. He's so planar and so rhythmic. And everything's on a diagonal, so everything's on the move. And he took, I mean, the, he takes if there's, he's not anxious in that way. He's almost a kind of spiritual ecstasy in some of these paintings. Um, but, you know, he, so he has this kind of linear structure, planar structure as well, that's dynamic. And then he punctuates this velvety dark space with incredibly bright color in some instances. And so there's this pulsation, this flickering that goes on. Um, you get swept up in this tsunami-like structure um, so that you're pulled in, you go back, and you come over. The painting sort of spills over you. And it's um, amazing, because it's absolutely seamless. If you took something out, the painting would collapse. So again, he's somebody that I've, I've looked at um, quite a bit. Um, Okay, I'll go through these next few images where I'm, um, this is a painting from Chautauqua in New York, upper New York State. And the foreground's low, and then I want to pull back across the lake to the hills, and then have the clouds come sweeping over and try and get some kind of punchy color in there. Again, Chautauqua, and I wanted a sort of scooping sense with a weight at the top of the painting. Um, this is a from uh, my sabbatical in Spain last fall, a storm sky in Spain. This is a similar motif to the first image you just saw um, on paper, and this is a paint oil painting of the same subject matter of Chautauqua. This is Spain looking down into the um, citrus groves and down some cliffs. But again, I wanted that, you know, I just can't have this experience in, in the Midwest, this dropping down and then rising up. And here's a sunset from Oxbow. Um, okay, the second structure I use is um, a kind of more Baroque structure, um, so that there's these, these looping rhythms, and there always seems to be um, a pivotal vertical um, form that to me acts like a swing door, so that you might move in from the left and move through these forms back and then around into the right hand side of the painting. Um, this particular painting is of a garden um, on, on the land of the, I, I paint on certain people's property, the Carters, who um, are art collectors. And um, this is their garden. And there's a sense though, when I was painting this, was that it was this really kind of um, flamenco, like I kept thinking of a flamenco dancer on the left, kind of weaving and moving through the space and stumping into the earth. And um, there's a, such a kind of sensuality to that dance and a controlled movement. Um, it's a sort of garden of earthly delights in relation to the desert around it. Um, I had a weird experience here. Um, I, I was painting on this painting and a collared dove came and sat on the upper right. And it kind of hung out for 15 to 20 minutes and I thought, 
I didn't know what this was. Uh, and I, what a man. I thought, guys, this is the ghost of a former painter who used to be here telling me I really ought to do something with the upper right. And, um, or then I thought, guys, this is the Annunciation. Am I all of a sudden pregnant? Um, you know, I just thought, this is so magical and wild. Um, so things can happen when you're outside. <laughs> Um, this is a painting of the lagoon in Michigan, um, and again, it's sort of it's a diptych actually. Um, so that there's the, the, sometimes my paintings seem to divide themselves into these two halves. They have different, a sort of more activity on the left and a calmness on the right. But when I that black shape kept growing and growing, and it just like a whack in the face, and so I had to leave it. Another painting of uh, Michigan. Um, I want to say that I'm interested in the intersection of uh, human-made forms and natural parts of the landscape. That in my most recent work, there seem to be these obstacles in the foreground that you have to get over and to get into the, the big movements within the painting, as if there's some kind of a metaphorical reference to being expelled from the Garden of Eden. And um, I don't mean Eden as some kind of Arcadia, some kind of paradise. I mean that it's a place where um, we can interact with nature on a sort of daily basis, as was true, say, 120 years ago, 150 years ago, where nature was part and parcel of people's everyday existence, um, or I should say the natural world. Um, and, and, you know, it's... it's it's I want a working relationship with nature, um, and we have become distanced, um, and so it is hard to overcome certain impediments to sort of get connected again. Um, the flamenco embodies this idea of a wilderness, a wildness, sort of orchestrated. And where I paint, it's it's sort of wild, but it's not mythic. I think there are real differences in between um, a European idea of wilderness and an American one. And Europeans have sort of lost this concept because the land's been manipulated for centuries. Um, and in Spain, I have to say that there's a sort of matter of factness about people's relationship to the land. It's abandoned farmland. It goes back in this area in terms of settlement to the Bronze Age. It's like, what's the big deal? Um, and there's a sort of, um, there's not a aggrandizing of the landscape. It's not like painting the Grand Canyon, or it's not a heroic vista the way Thomas Cole would have given us in the middle of the 19th century. Um, at this, you know, his concept of wilderness is, you know, it's something that has to be held at bay. It's like the storm is back there, and the um, Baroque movement of the sensuality of that river is kind of held back, and um, everything is at a safe distance. It's a sort of uh, manifest destiny where the other or the wild has to be tamed and conquered. Um, now, what I find in the Midwestern landscape and is a kind of ordinariness. It's sort of mundane. There's nothing spectacular. It's flat for miles. And um, this is Spain. Um, and there's something where there's a drama in the sky, but it's tempered by the flatness of the land. And I think that in um, Spain, the barrenness of this place, um, the scrubbiness, gives it a kind of quiet matter-of-factness, as though the desert is where we are in terms of the natural world today. Um, it's enveloping, but it's not overwhelming. And so my paintings um, are about a kind of desire a desire to belong and yet I don't belong, a desire to participate in, in the natural world, um, not as a tourist and yet I am a tourist. So there's this tension because I want a certain kind of intimacy. Rebecca Solnit, I'm coming to the end here. Um, Rebecca Solnit um, wrote, is a writer on art and she's, she wrote in her book Eve Said to the Serpent, 
she wrote about beauty. And she says, in the visual arts, beauty is often equated with corrupt seductiveness to be avoided. What is this fear of seduction? A fear that art may have power over us than we over it. A desire to reside in the rational space of the head rather than be drawn into the beauty of the body, which speaks to the senses. That to be seduced is to be reminded that there are things stronger than reason, than agenda. A fear of seduction is a fear of one's own vulnerability. It is the tension that beauty brings temptation and desire, fulfilled and unfulfilled. And so, I think that um, working from the landscape and sort of being out there in a place, it always exceeds my grasp. Um, I can never get a handle on it. And I am seduced by the elements, um, but it's, it's unpredictable, it's surprising, and it challenges me unlike anything else. Um, and it makes me vulnerable. So that's an experience of place that really keeps me painting. Um, this is the last painting, and I'm working on a series of paintings where I put, I paint um, separate paintings and then I put them all together and and then I rework the whole thing. And it's based on this, I'm really interested in trying to get everything within this huge vista that I see, but sort of holding on to the smaller moments in relation to a bigger vista. So thank you very much.